This week's topic is thermodynamics, which means heat and calorimetry will be the topics we'll be focusing on. So you've probably seen in previous courses the definition of heat in terms of specific heat capacity. Specific heat capacity is the ability of something to store heat. So if a substance has a high specific heat capacity, it can store a lot of heat without its temperature changing too much. The units are joules per kilogram degree Celsius. Q is heat in joules. M, of course, is mass in kilograms. And delta T is change in temperature. Now, you're going to see that this can be either kelvins or degrees Celsius, because those changes will be the same. The size of a Kelvin is the same as the size of a degree Celsius. So for example, if I have an initial temperature of zero degrees Celsius, that's the same as 273 Kelvins. If I have a final temperature of 100 degrees Celsius, that's 373 Kelvins. If I calculate delta T, T final minus T initial, I get 100 minus zero would be 100 degrees Celsius, or I get 373 minus 273, which is 100 Kelvins. So sometimes you're gonna see here, it will be a Kelvin, it doesn't matter because it's change that counts. Now also beware that the specific heat capacity of water is exceptionally high. That's why water is such a good coolant. But in mastering physics, it seems they're getting their questions and their data from all different sources because sometimes they'll say use 4186 joules per kilogram degree C. Sometimes they'll say use 4200. And if you wanna get the answer correct, you've gotta use the number they give you in the problem. And then sometimes they'll even say use 4190. So just beware that mastering physics is going to tell you which one to use and they're all okay. Okay, so that's just heat. Now phase changes uh, are something important that you're gonna to have to know about as well. So when things change phase, that means they melt or they boil or condense or freeze. Um, the temperature doesn't change, but certainly a lot of heat is involved. And so the equation is MLF, and this would be for freezing and melting. And so in other words, going from solid to liquid, doesn't matter whether you're going one way or the other, same amount of heat. And this is called the latent heat of fusion. And the units, notice how there's no delta T in that equation. The units are just joules per kilogram. And this has to happen at the melting point in order for this heat to be absorbed if something's melting or given off if it's freezing. Um, so that would be freezing and melting. And then similarly, we have MLV. This would be for boiling or condensing. And once again, doesn't matter which way you're going, the same amount of heat either absorbed or given off. Um, boiling and condensing. And this is called the latent heat of vaporization. It's called latent because it's a hidden, latent means hidden because apparently you can't see what's going on because the temperature doesn't change, but the phase changes and that's where the heat goes, goes into breaking the bonds or forming bonds. This is latent heat of vaporization. So the thing you have to be aware of is if you have ice say at negative five, you can't just melt it instantly. You have to bring it up to its melting point. And so a really good graph to keep in mind when you're doing these calorimetry problems is the graph of temperature versus heat. And let's just do a piece of ice. So I'm gonna draw this graph, it looks like this. So these temperatures, say this is minus five degrees Celsius and this is zero degrees Celsius and 100 degrees Celsius and then 120. As we move sideways along this graph, heat is being absorbed. So when the curve is a slant like that, this is Q, ice, would be MC for ice, 
delta t. So that you have to take the ice from negative five and warm it up to zero before it'll melt. Now this flat part, this would be the MLF part. The temperature doesn't change. At the left-hand side here, it would be all ice at zero. And then as it starts to melt, you'd have some ice, some water, some ice, some water. And as you move over to the right, pretty soon you've got just water at zero degrees. All the ice is melted and you've absorbed that amount of heat. Now this is just water. And the amount of heat here would be MC water delta T, where sea water would be different than sea ice. Sea water is the 4186, sea ice is about 2100. And once again, they're gonna give you different numbers there. Sometimes they'll say it's 2100 joules per kilogram degree Celsius. Sometimes they'll say 2090. So once again, depends on their source and what the conditions are for where they got those numbers, but make sure you use what they say in the problem. The LF is also gonna be given, it's pretty well consistent. LF is always given as 3.34 times 10 to the five joules. It's a lot of energy it takes to melt ice. That's LF for water. Now up here, you've got water at 100. Now it's gonna to start to boil. And so as it boils and boils and boils, this Q would be the MLV. And the LV, they do give different numbers. So LV for water, heat of vaporization, sometimes they're gonna say it's 2.4 times 10 to the six, but sometimes they're gonna say it's 22.6 times 10 to the five. And I don't, why the, I don't know why they put it as incorrect scientific notation. Much better to have 2.26 times 10 to the six. It's a lot more energy to boil water than it is to melt ice because you have to break all the bonds and get those liquid um, molecules up into gaseous form. Now this part, this would be steam and this would be Q for the steam would be MC steam delta T. Now you can't heat up steam unless you catch it and pressurize it. So I don't think you have any problems where you're having steam heated up. Okay. now. The thing is you can't jump around on this curve. If you start down here at point A, you must go warm it up, melt it, warm the water, boil it, warm the steam. You can't just jump from ice to steam. You have to go along the curve. Okay, so if you want power, often they'll say questions like, you have a kettle and there's so much power, how long does it take to boil the water? Well, the power is just heat over time. So you can just use the Q, whatever Q they're talking about, whether it's warming water or boiling water or melting ice or whatever, and you divide by time and that will be the power in watts. Okay, now the delta T's are problematic. When we're doing calorimetry, which means we're gonna have heat lost equals heat gained. Now, if you do it like that, there are no negatives. Heat loss equals heat gain, heat's a positive quantity. If you do it, sometimes in the textbook, they'll go the change in heat is zero, which means something is gonna to have to have negative changes in order for something to have positive changes and the sum of them equals zero. So for example, uh, the way I like to lay it out so that things stay organized, is like this. Let's say we have an example where we've got a piece of hot copper, or hot metal. And it's going to cool off to cold metal. So let's say this metal is at 100 degrees Celsius and we're gonna cool it down to 60 degrees Celsius. And the way we do that is by putting it into water. So the other component of the problem will be the water. So this is a metal and this is a the water. These are typical questions. You take some hot metal, you put it in water, the water warms up, the metal cools off. And then there's some question like, what is the specific heat capacity of the metal or what's the final temperature or how much water did you need? But in general, let's just get this, how you deal with these, uh, temperature changes. So let's say that the water started out pretty cold, 10 degrees Celsius. 
Now in the end, they always have to be at the same temperature to reach his equilibrium. So this has to be 60 and this is warm. Okay, the metal's gone from hot to cold, so it's lost. So this is heat lost. The water's gone from cold to hot, so it's heat gained. That's how you know what side of the equation to put it on. Now, as far as the delta T's go, always use hot minus cold. So delta T is hot minus cold. That way it's always gonna be a positive number. You've balanced the heat by putting the lost and the gained on opposite sides, and this works every time. So if you're gonna do the delta T for the metal, hot minus cold, 120 minus 60. So the delta T for the metal is 60. If you're gonna do the water, hot minus cold, 60 minus 10. And it's delta T is 50. And then you just make sure you do the MC delta T for the metal on the opposite side of the equation to the MC delta T for the water. And everything is positive. And you can solve for whatever you need to solve for. Okay, so that's how calorimetry problems work. Another um, pretty tricky question that you often get is how much ice do you have to put in a hot cup of coffee to get cold water or cool off your cup or something like that? So this is adding ice to warm water, coffee or something. The thing you have to remember is you start out with this piece of ice and say it's at negative five degrees Celsius. Where you first you're gonna have to bring it up to water at zero. So you're gonna have to MC ice delta T. Delta T here would be hot minus cold, zero minus minus five. Delta T would be five. Sorry, this is it's not water, it's it's still ice. It's at zero, MC delta T. Now you melt it. And so that would be the MLF. Sometimes you see capital, sometimes you see small l, f, that's okay. Now it's gonna be still at zero. This is still, darn, I should have drawn that like an ice cube. It's still ice at zero. Now it's water, at, it's still at zero. Now you have to bring it up to the final temperature, whatever it is, T final. And it's still water. And so it's M C water delta T. And this delta T would be T final minus zero. So that's just T final. All that is heat gained. That goes on the left. So you'd have to add all three terms. And that's just for the ice. Then if you've got the coffee or the hot water or something else, that's the MC delta T on the other side of the equation. So just be aware when you've got this ice, Students are always forgetting you have three terms. MC ice, then that's the mass of ice. That's the mass of ice melting. And then that's always a capital. And then that's the mass of ice. Even though it's now turned to water, it's the same mass. You don't lose anything. All those, this is all the same mass. Ice, ice, ice. And that's equal to the heat gained. That goes on, it doesn't matter left or right. And then depending on what's losing heat goes on the other side of the equation. Okay, so that should do you for this chapter.